everybody. We are live here on this wonderful um, Tuesday evening. It feels like more like an evening now since daylight savings has ended and we are, uh, sun's going down earlier. Uh, my name is Ed Portillo and uh, I am excited to be here. Um, I'm a program coordinator with NAMI Orange County. I've been with NAMI for about uh, going on three years now. And um, one of the joys of this job is doing uh, presentations or hosting presentations called In Our Own Voice. Uh, before the pandemic, my, one of my jobs was every week to go to um, a behavioral ward in Laguna Beach at Mission Hospital and to host in our own voice presentations. And um, it's, it's great because you get to hear not only um, a person's story and, and the, the resilience and, and where they've been through, but you, you also hear the hope and you can get some strength from listening to their story and listening to the people amongst um, the audience at the behavioral unit was really inspiring to know that they can be encouraged to know that this um, diagnosis that they might have does not define who they are, does not define um, their whole life. They can still have a an enriching, fulfilling life um, if they have a diagnosis. So it's definitely something that we are um, excited about. And I'm going to jump into it, pass it over to Gina in just a sec. And but first, let me just give a little bit of a background um, on, on NAMI. The National Alliance on Mental Illness is a United States-based advocacy group originally founded as a grassroots group by family members of people diagnosed with mental illness. NAMI identifies its mission as being dedicated to building better lives for the millions of Americans affected by mental illness. What we're about to experience is in our own voice presentations. The goal of this presentation is to change attitudes, assumptions, and ideas about people with mental health conditions. These presentations provide a personal perspective of mental health conditions as leaders with lived experience talk openly about what it's like to have a mental health condition. They break up their story into sections, starting with their dark days, acceptance, treatment, coping skills, and successes, hopes, and dreams. And then we will also be taking questions and also, um, it, at any point, if you do have a question, you can go to the Q&A button and click on that and ask a question. And Tina would be happy to uh, pause her conversation or her presentation to answer that question if it's very pending. But if not, we will have a time at the end. And since uh, usually we try to have two uh, presenters, um, but during the holidays, it's a little bit difficult to with everyone's schedule. So Gina will have a little bit of time to uh, present uh, her one of her talents that she has. One of the great things that of, about Gina is that she's a poet. She's a published uh, poet with, I believe, is it three or, or four books of poetry? Four. Four books of poetry. And um, we will hear a couple of them before we get into the question and answer time. So with no further ado, I want to pass it over to Gina Capo Bianco, and she is a, a special education teacher in the Los Angeles uh, Unified School District, and she has been with us for, I think, about two, 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 three years, something like that about as that. well. Yeah, 2019. So we're really excited to have her back, and I'll hand it over to Gina. Thank you, Ed. Um, um, thank you for all being here tonight. Um, I just want to start by saying, I have a mental health condition. Um, I was, um, I've been diagnosed with major depression and generalized anxiety disorder. Um, and I, I tend to speak openly about those disorders. And tonight I'm going to um, kind of take you through my journey um, because I, I really believe that when you have a mental illness, you're on a journey. And there are times when things are, are going well and there are times when things are not going well. Um, so I'd like to start out with the dark days from, I mean, I think dark days is an appropriate, um, title for what they are. Cause when you suffer from depression, it really is darkness. Um, it's sometimes hard to put into words what, um, depression is like for me, the depression started almost 35 years ago. I was, um, 14 or 15. And I 
don't have a lot of memories from that time is one of the things depression does is it steals your memories. Um, so I don't like remember the specifics of it starting. I just remember it being there. And it, it was like a dark cloud hanging over me all the time. And it reached a point where I didn't want to continue. Um, I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know who I could reach out to. And, you know, this was the 1980s. And at that time, things were a lot different than they are now. There weren't resources in the schools for kids who were struggling. I remember the school counselor knew that I was struggling, knew that I had a lot of suicidal ideation. And she would always tell me, oh, things will get better. Things will get better. And that that didn't help. Um, but that's, you know, I don't fault her for that looking back on it. That's just the way things were and during that time period. Um, my family didn't really know what was going on. I was always very quiet. So for me to sink into depression just kind of seemed like me being introverted. The darkness kept getting worse and I don't know how I discovered it, but at some point I discovered writing and I started writing poetry and I would write what I was feeling. And I kept them in notebooks that I kept with me at all times. I was never without my notebook. Uh, I eventually ended up with five or six of them um, and it was just filled with poetry. I don't know what made me write a poem that first time. Like I said, the, that memory is gone, but the poems are still there. And um, I actually still have them. They're locked up. I haven't, I haven't looked at them in over 30 years. And I don't know if I will ever go back to those because I do know they were very, very dark. Um, so that, as the depression kept getting worse, I, I went without getting help. I knew I was struggling, but I didn't know what it was. No one used the word depression. Um, eventually I had my first anxiety attack. I was 19 or 20. Um, and I, I actually do remember that specific moment. Um, I was in college and I was at a football game and I was supposed to be, um, working in the, the press box, keeping stats for the football game. And all of a sudden everything just closed in around me. And I felt like this intense pressure on my body and in my head, everything just felt like it was screaming. And it was all I could do to get away from where I was at. Um, and that was my first, um, whether you wanna call them an anxiety attack or panic attack, I, I the, for me, the words are interchangeable. Shortly thereafter, I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety for the first time. Um, so I had gone, five or six years undiagnosed um and it was the first time anyone had ever used the word depression to describe what i was going through and i was able to start seeing a therapist and i was put on medication for the first time that started what's been pretty much a lifetime of medication and therapy for me um and those those dark days they continue I mean, there are times like I, I, I can function, I hold down a job, I can do that. But there are times when sometimes it's just a front, like inside the depression has taken over and my thoughts are really, whether they're, they're dark or they're just really negative. And I have to force myself to put up a front so that other people don't know because most people don't understand what it's like to live with depression and anxiety. And you hear people say, oh, well, can't you just smile or, oh, cheer up, it'll get better. And it, it doesn't work that way. Um, I can tell myself that a hundred times. And if my mind is not in a place where it's going to accept that, it's just the depression's gonna stay. Um, so I've lived with it. For 35 years, some of the times have been better than others. Um, and it's, I've lived with the stigma. I think stigma is a very real thing for people with mental illness because it's, 
it's one of those invisible health disorders that people can't see. So when when you suffer from from it, they don't see you wearing a cast. You know, when you when you break your leg, someone's oh, how are you? How did you do it? But when you're depressed, you can't just go and say, I'm feeling depressed. People don't understand. So there's that stigma. And that stigma is painful. I've experienced it in the workplace. I've experienced it in my family, um, with friends. One of the hardest places to deal with it is when that stigma comes from medical professionals. Um, and I've, I've dealt with that and I've talked to other people with mental health disorders that have experienced stigma in all those same places. And that's, it's really painful. Um, it, is, it is a health disorder. Um, mental health, emotional health are part of total health and it gets overlooked. Um, so I, moving from the dark days into the next section is acceptance. When you live with a mental health disorder, you have to learn to accept it because you can't heal until you've accepted that you have a mental health disorder. For me, it took a long time. I was in my 40s before I really started coming to an acceptance with it, um, being able to look at someone and say, I suffer from depression, I have an anxiety disorder, to be able to say I have a mental illness. That took a lot. And um, acceptance means being able to realize that mental illness is gonna always be present. The darkness is gonna come and go. Um, I'm gonna, some days I'm gonna feel fine. Other days, I'm not gonna wanna get out of bed. Um, and that understanding that that's okay. Um, it's, it's part of the illness. It doesn't make me a weaker person. Um, in fact, I think people who's, who suffer from or struggle with mental illness have to be pretty strong to, to put up a front, to hold down a job when you're feeling awful and nobody wants to recognize it. Um, I, I can't tell you the number of times I've said, oh, I don't feel good, I must be catching a cold when really it's been my mental health. But I can't, I can't look at my boss and say, I need a mental health day because I get looked at as being a weaker person. But if I have a, a cold or the flu, it's acceptable for me to go home. Um, and that's something that we have to change in the way mental health is, is viewed in society. And um, it makes it difficult for people, people like me who have a mental illness when we have to hide it. But even though we hide it, we have to accept it. And accepting it means it's okay to have a mental illness. I'm, I know there's people that I can trust to know about it. And I know there's people that I'm not going to talk to about it. Um, but that acceptance for me actually came with the help of um, a primary care provider that I had a few years ago. Um, I had been seeing the same psychiatrist for over 10 years, and I was having some physical problems that were associated with my mental illness. And I was, I was in the doctor's office, and I was seeing my primary care, who was a physician's assistant, and one day she asked me um, why I was taking a certain medication the way I was taking it. And I looked at her and I, I didn't know how to answer that question. So I just said, well, that's what my psychiatrist says to do. And I'll never forget the look on her face. She just kind of looked at me kind of concerned and kind of quizzical and she said, that's not the way you're supposed to take that medication. And it, it suddenly dawned on me that I wasn't getting the care that I needed and that I was doing something wrong. And it, this physician's assistant, she's, she asked me about the other medications and we went through all my medications. She sat down with me and she checked every medication and it turned out I was over-medicated. My psychiatrist who I was trusting because I didn't know any better had me on a medication for one thing and another medication to do the opposite. So like I would be on medication to sleep and then in the morning I'd take a, medic a medication that would help me be awake. 
Um, I was on several different antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications. Every time I'd see my psychiatrist, she would um, either add a prescription or change a dose. And I was a walking medicine cabinet. And it was that um, physician's assistant who made me realize I had to stop that. And we even discovered I was actually addicted to one of the anti-anxiety medications. And it took a lot of work and accepting that I had to trust somebody to help me get through that. And um, I was able to walk away from the psychiatrist I was seeing and it took several tries. I had to search um, and try different ones until I finally found one that has helped me accept my mental illness and helped me find the right treatment plan for it. Um, and that's been really crucial because you have to be able to trust your team of providers. Um, you know, I have a psychologist and a psychiatrist and I know that I can trust them now. Um, and that's led to a change in treatment for me. And treatment's the next area I'd kind of like to touch on. You have to accept your mental illness before you can get the right treatment. And I discovered a couple of years ago um, through the help of my psychiatrist that my, my depression is treatment resistant. I've been on so many different medications over the years and it would never get better. Um, and so we, we looked at other options and I was scared. Um, you know, one of the options was um, ECT, which I had read about and I did not want to try because I already felt like I was losing memories and it was, you have to be sedated and it was kind of scary. So I, I knew I didn't want that. Um, we looked at ketamine and I wasn't quite ready for that. So we, we settled on um, TMS, which is transcranial magnetic stimulation. And in 2019, I went through that for the very first time. And it was an amazing experience for me because it, it took me from the depths of depression, which I had sunk back down into, to feeling alive again. Um, and TMS is not for everyone. And I'm not, um, I don't talk about it as something that's a cure-all for everyone. It works for some people, it doesn't work for others. Um, and it's a commitment um, because it's like about 38 um, treatment sessions. But that treatment was life-changing for me. I'm, I'm able to function and I have to continue it. Like I've, I've gone through it three times now. Um, and I know that eventually the effects will wear off and I'll have to go through it again. But I trust the team of um, providers that, that, um, that lead me through the TMS and that treat me with the TMS. And it, it's what enables me to continue working, um, to have a job. It's what enables me to advocate for mental health. If I wasn't getting the treatment I'm getting, I wouldn't be able to speak out um, and be a voice. So for me, treatment is is crucial. I need I need to be in therapy. Um, I you know my I've been with my therapist for a long time. Um, he's a psychologist, and he that therapy is a key component because you need someone to talk to. Talking is a, being able to talk about it and put it in perspective is is crucial along with medication and for me, TMS. Um, so treatment is a very, it's something that you have to be a part of. And that's, I think probably the biggest discovery I made is that I need to be an active participant in my treatment. Before I just blindly followed a psychiatrist and she led me down the wrong road because she was just writing prescriptions. You no, know, it was, it was like, a, I'd walk in there and she'd pull out the prescription pad, write something and I'd walk out with a new prescription. It's not like that anymore. I have an active role in my treatment and um, I would encourage anyone that has a mental health disorder or who knows someone who has one to encourage them to be active participants, to take a role in your treatment and understand how you're being treated and why you're being treated. Um, 
so it's it's just it's one of the things I've learned and it's helped me accept my mental illness and helped me function in society. There are other coping skills um, that help me. For me, one of the biggest coping skills is writing. And as I mentioned earlier, I discovered writing when I was young. I was um, a teenager when I started writing poetry and I've been writing poetry for almost 35 years. Um, it allows me to release what I'm feeling. It allows me to get the thoughts out of my head, to get the emotions out of my head. And I feel a sense of release. I can feel them coming out of my head, down my arm, into my pen and onto the paper. And once they're on the paper, I can deal with them concretely. So they, they go from being abstract thoughts to concrete objects that I can deal with. And I've used them in therapy to discuss what I'm feeling. I've used them just on my own to read them and understand what I'm going through. And once I started getting better and accepting my own mental illness, I was able to use my poetry to relate to others. And I've found it as a good um, tool for advocacy. Is when I share my poetry, people are, a lot of people are saying, I feel that way too. And they can understand, and maybe I've put into words what they've been trying to put into words and it helps them um, understand and know they're not alone. Um, that, that, so writing is probably my biggest coping skill. Um, I'm currently, I'm, I have four books that I've actually been able to publish that are all related to my mental health journey. And I'm currently working on a fifth book. Um, so writing is, is instrumental for me. Um, I other, have other coping skills include, um, you know, meditation, um, listening to music. I find music has been um, key for me. In fact, as a teenager, there was a song that I, I truly believe kept me alive. Um, I remember um, wanting to end my life and coming close to it. And there was a song that I would play. Um, I don't know, how, it's, it's a pretty old song, but um, it's called Let It Go um, by Grace Slick, um, who was uh, one of the original members of the Jefferson Airplane um, back in the 60s. And the song just talks about how you have to let things go. And I remember I would play it and I, I had it on vinyl. So I would play it on the record player and I knew exactly where to put that needle when I was getting down. And I countless times I stopped in the, in the effort of trying to end my life by listening to that song. Um, I was really lucky that I got to actually um, thank Grace Slick for her song um, a few years ago. She had an art exhibit and I was able to go and tell her that story and thank her. And I remember she, she wouldn't accept the thanks. She says, she looked at me and she says, you had the strength to overcome that. It wasn't the song, but I'm, I'll be forever grateful to that song. And I still listen to it. It's on my phone. Um, it, the power of music is powerful. So sometimes I just listen to music to help me cope. Um, you know, I have a couple of good friends that I can rely on that understand, um, they, they know my coping skills and they'll remind me of them. They'll just let me talk if I need to talk. Sometimes they'll just sit and we just sit and do nothing, but just having someone there is a coping skill for me. Everything put together as far as, you know, living with a mental illness, coming to terms with with it, learning to accept it, receiving treatment, led me to view things in a way I never thought I would. Um, and that's to look at successes, hopes, and dreams. Um, it takes a strong person to be able to live with a mental illness um, because we do do a lot of hiding behind a facade of being okay. And we can be successful. And, and for me, one of the most successful things I've done is being able to advocate for mental health. And I, um, 
my fourth book I dedicated to all the individuals who are still on their journey and not ready to speak out yet. Um, I dedicated to them that they find their voice. And I think everything that I've been through has helped me find a voice to speak up for mental health and to be able to, to work with NAMI and um, speak on nights like this um, or speak through my books. My books all talk about my journey and share information about mental health. That's been a success for me and it's something that I wanna keep, keep doing. Um, I have a goal of um, talking to medical professionals because that's one area where I think people suffer a lot of pain. Um, and I've heard, I've heard stories of what it's been like when doctors or nurses dismiss or downplay a mental illness. Um, and I wanna help make them more aware of what it's like to live with a mental illness and help them understand that it truly is a health disorder. Um, and if I can do that, I'll be successful. And it's, it's a dream of mine to be able to, to be a voice for others, as well as for myself, um, to be able to advocate for myself. And I struggle with it. I know sometimes I go into the doctor's office and I'm not able to advocate for myself because I'm feeling really down, um, but I keep trying and I'm hoping that through my work, I can help others do that. Um, so I guess the biggest dream is, is to continue and not let the mental illness stop me. Um, not let it weigh me down to the point where I'm not a voice. Um, recognizing that just because I have a mental illness doesn't mean I can't speak up for those of us that have this disorder. Um, so my, my dream is to continue doing that. Um, I, I'd like to do more of it. Um, it it's nice like these that are, um, that mean a lot to me because I can share my message and I can give people hope. And I think hope is the biggest thing that we need. When you live in a world of darkness, you need hope. And throughout my poetry, there's themes of darkness and light. Darkness is the depression, the anxiety, and light is the hope that we have of getting through it. With that being said, I'd like to share a couple poems. Um, um, some of my poetry is very dark and I'm gonna start with one that's kind of dark. Other poems are light. I try to make sure I have a balance in my books. Um, this is from my book, uh, A Light Amidst the Darkness, Illuminating Mental Illness and Suffering. Um, it's called The Smothering Hand of Depression. The smothering hand of depression suffocates me. I gasp for breath as I search for meaning in my life. The depression bears down upon me, crushing my desires and dreams. Underneath the weight of depression, I am weak. I hide from life, afraid to push back against the depression that has been a part of my life for so long. I do not remember life without it. As I struggle, my hope dwindles. The hand presses down more firmly. I cannot get back up. The smothering hand of depression has taken my life. Um, and that, that's how it feels sometimes. Um, and it's easier for me to explain it in poetry than to just talk about it. This one's a little more positive and it's, it's about how, how writing sustains me and allows me to cope with mental illness. It's called My Pen. When my mind is full of turmoil, I turn to my pen, reach for my journal and begin to write. Words take the form of lines. The poison pours out of me. My pen is an instrument of healing. The ink gives life to the words I cannot voice. Line after line, page after page, filled with my thoughts. 
I feel each thought as it leaves my mind to make its mark upon the paper. The page soaks up my memories, becomes stained by my pain. Dark thought after dark thought is released and allowed to breathe on the page. In these moments, I feel lighter. A sense of healing envelops me as my turmoil escapes. My pen provides this passage to healing. Each poem I write gives me the courage to continue. My journals hold the reality of my pain, relieving me of my pain and allowing me to live. Um, that kind of just goes to how powerful poetry is for me um, and how healing it is for me. Um, this one I wrote, um, it's about um, the, the medical visit I had where um, the physician's assistant was able to help me. And it all was because of a question she asked. She took the time to understand and it's, we need more people like her in medicine. It's called a simple question. You asked a question when I thought no one cared. As you awaited my response, I saw the look in your eyes. You really wanted to know my answer. You cared when no one else did. My reply was simple, but you heard so much more. The answer I gave was not enough. You wanted to know more to really understand. So you coaxed and you prodded. I did not know anything was wrong until you explained. With heartfelt words and keen understanding, you took me in, enabled me to understand. In that moment, you changed my life. You started my healing with one simple question. Open my eyes and gave me hope. Today, I reflect back on that moment. I wonder if you know what a difference you made. You stepped in when no one else could. I am forever grateful that you took the time to ask a question and listened for my answer. You went beyond your role and made a difference. And I'll just read one last one. Um, this one's kind of more of a positive um, one. And it's from my first book, which came out in um, 2016, called Cognizant Introspection. The title is The Woman in the Mirror. As I gaze into the cracked mirror, my inner soul is reflected. I see the past unfold within the eyes looking back at me. She alone knows all I have been through and all I will become. Scars left by trials imprinted their marks upon my heart. Yet a strength I didn't know I possessed emerges, the cracks slowly disappear. The woman in the mirror smiled. At last, I know I am the woman in the mirror. So I guess at this point, I'll open it up to questions or turn it over to Ed. Yeah, thank you, Gina. This is so good. I always enjoy hearing your poems and uh, Gina has actually done some presentations specifically just with her poems and she gives backstories to each of them. So it's really um, when you're sitting there listening to the poems, it's it's a lot more connected. You're connected to the story because it's all connected to her life. So thank you so much, Gina, for sharing those and, and your story. Um, yes, we will open up to questions. And before I get to the questions, just wanted to send a reminder if anybody is new to NAMI Orange County or wants more information about what we do in Orange County, our website is namioc.org, www.namioc.org. And our resource line is the OC warm line that's open 24 hours a day for conversations or text at 714-991-6412. 
That's 714-991-6412. It's our resource slash warm line. If somebody needs support or resources for Orange County, uh, feel free to give a call to that number. Um, our first question, go ahead and, and uh, ask in the Q&A question uh, button if, uh, if you have any questions out there. Um, I have our first question here from uh, Bernadette says, do you have private insurance or is it county funded? Um, I have um, private insurance. Are there any other questions? If you wanted to type that into the Q&A, feel free to do that. Hi, hey, there's Austin. Austin. Hi, everyone. yeah, I'm Austin. I'm the program supervisor from Naomi Orange County. Um, but um, yeah, I actually have a question about um, TMS because um, I've been interested in that a long time. Can you talk a little bit about that kind of what that process is like um, and you know what kind of changes you saw come from that either right away afterwards or maybe in the days following those those um, I guess therapies. Right, sure. Um, TMS is um, a non-traditional treatment for depression and anxiety. Um, in order to qualify for it, you have to have tried other treatment plan, usually medications that have not worked. Um, and then you go in and there's a psychiatrist who evaluates you. Um, they, they, like in my case, they connected with my psychiatrist. They evaluated me and determined that I was a good candidate for it because medication was not working. And then I don't know all the technical aspects of it, but what's, what it is is MRI technology. And they, they run some tests and they figure out where exactly to place the technology on your head and you're sitting in a chair it's kind of like a dentist chair you you recline and there's a, a a pad is placed over your head and um all you feel is a tapping it's it's just a light tapping if depending on whether it's a depression or anxiety it's either a slower tap or a faster tap um and you sit there for it for me the treatments were about 45 minutes each and all I would feel is the tapping. And um, there was always um, a nurse there to make sure I was doing okay. Um, there's really no side effects other than sometimes you get headaches. Um, that wasn't a real problem for me. Um, and then weekly I would meet with either the psychiatrist or a, psych uh, a nurse, psychiatric nurse practitioner um, to, to monitor my my moods and how I was doing. And like when each of the times I've started, I was in a really dark place. I had hit pretty low. Um, and usually about this late second week, third week, I would start to feel that lifting. Um, and like I said, it's about 38 sessions and you go for most of the time you go five days a week. Um, and Usually, like I said, in that third week, I would I would start to feel it lifting, and it would just keep getting better and better. My mood would get lighter and lighter, and feel like the depression was lifting, and I wasn't as anxious. Um, and they would monitor. They have me would have you fill out forms each week to to rate your depression and anxiety, and you could see as I was filling them out that I was getting better, that I was feeling better, and I. It's like magic. I don't know how to explain it. Um, it's something in the MRI technology. They're stimulating part of the brain um, to change brain patterns, and that lifts the depression. Um, for me, it's been a great experience. The first time I went through it, I went about 10 months before I needed to go back. Um, the second time, it only lasted about six months. Um, some of that could have been situational, but um, yeah, I was right in the range where they they start to you. It's not uncommon to have to go back. Um, so I've gone through it three times. Um, right now, I, I'm in a pretty good place. Um, I finished treatment in September, um, and you know, I'm, I'm hoping to to get a, several months out of it, and then if I go back. I'll go back. It's it's non-invasive. It's not painful. Um, and for me, it's 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 that magic test that's really worked. Um, 
so I, 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 I think it's, for me, it, it's been, the, it's been the magic trick that's worked. Um, nothing ever worked for me. And when you feel that depression lifting, it's, it's a totally different feeling. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing. Yeah, I'm, re I'm really glad that that worked for you. You know, it's, it's a intriguing new, you know, therapy option. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, glad, it's nice to meet someone who's found some, some relief from that. So thank you for, thank you for sharing on that. You're welcome. And Gina, another question from Bernadette. This may be um, not as specific. So, oh yeah, what does TMS stand for? Transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, so what are your thoughts? No. Basically, Go the ahead. magnetic um, stimulation is, is just going through your cranium. It, it's it's on. It's just placed on your head, and the stimulation goes through your head. It's non invasive. What are your thoughts on somebody in crisis and dealing with legal matters where not even the county of Orange is acknowledging your mental health condition? Um, that's a difficult question. I think um, that's where advocacy groups come in into play. And if you have, um, whether it's a psychologist, a therapist, or an advocate that can help you um, or help the person, I, it's, you need to start seek out those type of resources. I know a lot is changing right now. Um, and I know just recently there was a law change that's allowing people to get treatment faster. Um, uh, it's kind of above or out of my, my scope of knowledge to answer this question, but I would just be determined and seek out resources. Um, and NAMI has a lot of resources and might be able to guide you to the right resource. Um, if you call their warm line. Yep. The warm line again is 714-991-6412. It's 714-991-6412 for resources and support. And we can take a couple more questions. We're still um, making some good time here. If anybody else has a question, let's see here. Um, Bernadette says, I truly admire your journey to overcome the desire to end Everything um, might get well date to live is June of 2015. Thank you. Right. No. Um, and I admire you for being able to, um, to acknowledge that. And uh, if you miss anything about this talk or wanted to hear it again, we will be putting this on our social media. Uh, so on our Facebook, on our YouTube pages, so that you can rewatch it and even send it to other people that maybe didn't make it that would like to see it. Um, yes, Bernadette says, thank you and God bless. Thank you, Bernadette. Thank you. Yes. And uh, oftentimes this is a great resource for families, individuals that are taking our family to family class, um, which is a 12 week class geared for families who have been loved one or a family member who has a mental um, uh, diagnosed mental health diagnosis, and uh, they often come to, we, we, we want them to come to in our own voice presentations so that they could get a, get a glimpse of there is uh, hope. There is hope. Um, they're not going to be in a sense of crisis all the time. Um, there is a way to help their family member and support their family member, and so this is a great way to also send, if you wanted to send this, or you are a family member yourself, send it to other families um, and our own voice is a great resource for that as well. Um, so I think it looks like we're we're getting close to the end here, um, unless somebody else has another question they'd like to ask. Uh, again, any uh, questions on our on our uh, programs or what we offer in Orange County? Everything pretty much is on Zoom right now, so really, it, it can go beyond Orange County. But we we definitely offer it for the the people of Orange County. It's all on our website at namioc.org. And, um, oh, question is, do we have a lecture every month? We actually are gonna do that. Um, yes, uh, we will probably have an In Our Own Voice every month going, um, starting in January. So we will, uh, this is our last In Our Own Voice of this year um, because we already in, in December, believe it or not. And, we are going to be starting off in January with another In Our Own Voice and also February. So we're going to try to do 
and in our own voice presentation uh, once a month, if that's possible and our schedule permits and the presenter schedules work out as well. So uh, also Austin is in, in the chat saying uh, 211oc.org is another great self-service resources. Anybody can look at that on the chat. And um, okay, there's a question says, Bernadette says, do you think you can be suicidal subconsciously? Um, um, I, I think that's possible. I think the thoughts become um, almost automatic. And I think at, when they're at that level, um maybe they're not something that someone's going to act on but it's i think that's where the ideation comes in um but yeah i mean that's not my area of, of expertise i'm 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 not a professional i'm just um someone who's lived with it and tries to share my story um but i think if any anytime you're having those type of thoughts whether consciously or subconsciously you do need somebody needs to seek help um there are um that's what the medical mental health professionals are out there for. Um, and anytime there's any threat on your life, you do need to seek help. Um, and I know if when I get like that, I have my plan in place for how I seek help. Um, I, I think that's crucial when you have a care team that you have a plan in place. And with my psychologist and psychiatrist, we have a plan in place for when I if I feel like that. Um, and that that's important to have a plan. That's a great parting message about being our own self advocate to have a plan to stick to that plan to review that plan and to have a, a team around you. And I, I think, um, Gina, you really eloquently explained the importance of that and how it works in your life. So, again, we appreciate your time. We're so excited that you um, have come and we look forward to having you again in 2022. And um, again, we will be having more of these every month. So just check your inbox or check our website or our social media for the next one that we announced in January. And with that, we're going to say goodbye and thanks again for coming. All right, Gina, we'll All see right. you. Thank you. All right, see you, Austin. Bye, everybody. Thanks a lot.